Hello everybody and welcome back to the Tone Aries podcast. As always, I'm joined by my good friend Timmy Lam. Hi everyone. And Robin is on the decks. And this week we have a guest, uh, his name is Derek Devoy. Um, you have a charity called Taxi Watch. Um, for the people that don't know you, who are you and where are you from? Um, first of all, I just want to say one quick thing. Um, well known for what you're doing, Silvius. Um, I know personally from having lived experience of it, um, how telling stories helps and save lives. Um, it, ge- it genuinely does, and I've seen it. I see it day in, day out. Um, everybody else who has lived experience with it, with suicide and depression and all that, they're the same. Um, they tell the story, they share the story, and it does help people. So you've saved lives, whether you know it or not. Like, um, Thank you. It's, Thank you, it's Derek. So fair play to you, too. Um, yeah. and I love this. I've watched every episode, every podcast you have. It's brilliant. Good um, I grew up in Dublin, 1975. Um Spent 10 years in Dublin, loved it, loved my whole life in Dublin, was brilliant. Um, ch- playing as a child, we, we walked out in the streets and we didn't come home till all hours of the night and, and that was the way it was and it was perfectly safe, there was no there was no trouble, there was no drugs, there was no hassle. Um, walked to school, got the bus to school, um, if you got the bus to school and the bus conductor didn't come down and take your money, you had 20 pence for sweets and it was it was brilliant. Like. Um, Went to school in, in Glasnevin, um, in Dublin, in St. Vincent's. Um, had a swim pool in this pool. Was absolutely loved it. Loved swimming and, and, and still do. Um, it was, it was nice. It was, it was a good life. I didn't have any um, bad bad things happen to me back then as a kid. Um, parents separated. Um, teens got bad in the house but, but between my parents. Um, and we eventually moved to Kilkenny. Um, and after that kind of happened, I'm sure everything goes through your head. Like, did the parents be dad not love me did my mother not love me what what why is this happening to me is it all my fault and all this stuff goes through your head and um i just didn't know any better so I kind of went a bit uh, a bit haywire as a kid moved to Kilkenny, which was was brilliant um i love Kilkenny, still there all my life now um it was, it was just it was amazing it was really really good to get out of dublin and kind of it was a complete different life um mm. I was driving tractors 10 years of age and driving in fields and and you would never have got a chance to do that um I often thought, like, what would life be like had I have grown up in Dublin all my life? Um, mm. It was just different. But school school in Dublin um, and school in Kilkenny was, was completely different. I went down to Kilkenny. Um, it was slower. It was a slower kind of place. It wasn't as, as busy as Dublin. It wasn't as fast as Dublin. Um, and it was, I kind of, we moved back to Dublin uh, after a couple of years. Um, I went to first year in Kilkenny. Um, then we moved back to Dublin. But before we moved back to Dublin, um, in first year in Kilkenny, I went to Russia on, on a school trip. Um, we hadn't a penny. We, we were, I won't say we were broke, but we, we were just normal family. Um, my mother was on her own. She worked, done every job she could do to kind of feed us. And it was only myself and my brother. And um, Russia, my mother, I know she went hungry to send me to Russia on a school trip like because she thought I'd never probably get the chance to go again or whatever. Um, I must it, have been really an eye, you know. Uh, yeah, well, I definitely was a niner. I was definitely a niner, but um, it's just it was nice. Everybody else was gone, and yeah. she didn't let me stay at home. I went, and and uh, it was amazing. It was an amazing trip. Like. The sacrifices the mothers yeah. make, you only realise when you're older. Like, you only realise you're older. When, at yeah. the time, at the time, I didn't probably yeah. wasn't grateful enough for it. I probably yeah. said, why, why can't I go? Like and yeah. stuff like that. But um, yeah, it was, it was hard. And and growing up without a, a dad in the house was 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 hard. And everybody else had one. Why, why didn't I? And all this sort of thing. And but the only thing is, I, I had to grow up fast. Um, and I remember we were going up and down. My dad lives in, lives in Dublin. We were going up and down the train um, myself for, for, for years. And I remember him coming down. I remember him saying to me, um, it's amazing because after I, I get into it further down in a few minutes, but um, later on in life, um, I, I found the reason to, to my depression was, uh, had a little thing to do with this. But um, he said to me, you're the man in the house now. Um, I was 10 or 11, whatever it was, coming down the train from Houston to Kilkenny. And he said, you're responsible for everything now. And you're and put that into my head. But I didn't, I didn't pick mm. up on it. I didn't know mm. anything about it. And I just turned out that I was. And, and, and mm. I had to do everything. I had to, I had to work. I had to do whatever I could do um, to get money and, and, and feed the family and, and feed everybody. And my mother done everything for us. She done absolutely everything for us. Um, but it was hard. It was, it was very, very hard. So we went back to Dublin um, for second year. I was in Dublin and Bray. Um, it was my dad came down and they had a chat about it and they went back to Dublin and that lasted a year. And we um, 
ended up coming back down to Kilkenny then to live and do my intercert, which I hated school. Uh, from from day one, I hated school. Uh, the very first day I arrived, I hated every school. Um, I had no interest in, in anything in learning. I just didn't want to learn and didn't need education. I was I knew everything back then. I was just hmm. didn't want to do it. I can relate with that. Yeah, yeah, and no, um, somewhere. Yeah, but it, it was hard. It was really hard, and so moved back to Dublin. Moved back down to Kilkenny then, done the intercert, passed it. Couldn't believe I passed it. It was the only thing I've ever passed in my entire life. Um, but while we were in when we were in Dublin living, I met um, a man um, who used to do in markets and, and he was selling stuff at the markets, Barry. Um, Barry's a great friend of mine. I know him all my life now. Um, he taught me everything. Um, he taught me everything about selling things, um, how to deal with the public. I, I never knew any of that. I hadn't. So he kind of became a father figure in the house. Um and I kept going down. So I was coming up and down to Dublin every weekend, working in, in the Blackrock Market in Dublin. And I was only a young a kid getting down to the book, but I loved it. And it got me away. But when I moved back to Kilkenny um, in school, I met with, I was the Dubs, was my nickname in school and uh, very original. But mm. um, I moved down and I never knew anything about drugs, never saw drugs, never done anything like that. And the lads um, that kind of surrounded me was, was a group of five or six lads and five of them are dead now. Um but I remember meeting them and asking them, uh, they said he'd come for a game of football. And I wasn't into any sports. I wasn't into sports whatsoever. I hated it. Uh, every sport I hated it. I liked snooker and that's about all. Um, so I went up to play soccer with the lads and they were sniffing glue and they were sniffing tip and they were sniffing. And I was just looking at them and said, what are you doing? Um, and they were just out of their head. And I was just looking at them and I said, no, I said, this is not for me. Like, cause first of all, my mother had killed me. Um, absolutely battered me when she found out I was doing it mm. so I just didn't do it but I was so lucky that I didn't because that one turn could yeah. have just mm. completely sent me down the road and as I said five of the lads are dead um, they're dead now and, I can, and one of them is still around and um, he's still in, in, mm. in bits the poor fella that's the, harsh, the harsh reality mm. the harsh realities of it yeah, yeah. Um, it's probably one of the most important choices well not choice one of the most important things you, you, you did mm. back then was not kind of go for the bag or the glue or whatever because yeah. that could have been the I was gone because you wanted I suppose when you're that age you want to fit into a group and well you see that's pressure, what it is pressure, like, yeah. yeah well I was never part of anything and that was the thing I was never part of a group I was yeah. never part of anything um, the first group I ever became part of was the altar boys in, in, in Dublin um, and Jack Regan was a man there that I met he was the very first person that, that ever gave me a chance at anything um, and got the man died this week actually Um and God love him. Um, yeah. He was brilliant. He, he allowed me into the Altar Boys. We, we went away to Ennis Diamond on, on trips for, mm. with the brass band. And it's, it's, it made me uh, uh, love Ennis Diamond and the Hinch. Um, we go there kind of yeah. a lot now on holidays because of that. And memories, like, it's brilliant. Um, and poor old Jack died this week. Um, but it was hard. It, it was extremely hard. And eventually um, went back down, got a job, um, start working. Um, I got a job in Dunn's. After after my intercert, that was my very first real paying job with a tax man, um, and I loved it. It was, it was wasn't hard work at all. I was I was working in the deli and Duns. Um, started to grow up and learn that look at the, you need to work and you need to do all this sort of thing. And um, yeah, it was, it was very hard. And I used to go up and down to Dublin on the weekends, and I was still working with Barry in Dublin, the markets and all that. And I loved it. I absolutely loved buying and stuff. So I kind of found a purpose to, to, to didn't know what I was doing didn't know what I was doing in life um, found a purpose and, and just done it um, at that age Derek did you have any pro- did you notice any anything any mental health issues no within yourself? never never had mental health problems in my life um, I never had depression I never knew anyone with depression I never knew anybody that was suicidal um, it just didn't come into my life and, and I didn't know anything about it Um and then, as I said, I met Sharon, my wife, when I was 17. I'm still with her now. We're married years, two kids, the whole lot. Um, everything's great. We don't fight. Um, mm. It's just, I wouldn't be here only for her, to be quite honest with yeah. you. And that's a, I'm being genuinely honest with you. Um, but we we friends then down in Kilkenny. And the first person I ever met with depression um, was a, fr- a very good friend of mine. And I just said, oh, she needs a good kick up the arse. Mm. I just never didn't know about it. I was ignorant to it. Um, yeah. And I feel ashamed of it now that I, that I came across that and I didn't know what to say to her or whatever. I hadn't a clue. And I said, yes, and he's worse. I said, the, the boyfriend, I am at the time, husband now, but um, I said, no, that's, that's, that's wrong. Like, it's, what's wrong with her? She, she has everything. She's your wife. She, how could she be depressed? So I said, I, I've never had depression, didn't know anything about it. And 
um, this person just uh, I just I was ashamed that, I, that the way I've thought about her and and, and said like look at the girl needs help and, and that's what it was and thank god she's got help now and everything's going grand but um yeah so i had a few different jobs over the years then i left uns and got another job and got another job and i was never out of work i've, I've been working since i was younger and um, it wasn't always hard work because i wouldn't work to keep myself warm um mm. physically like but um yeah so i eventually um got a job um got a taxi license and said right I, I just saw a new friends of mine had taxis and they were making more money than i was making in a week they were making it in a day and a saturday night like and i said what am i doing like so um i decided to go and apply for a taxi license and apply for it uh, got the license and start driving and, and martin butler in Kilkenny gave me the first start delighted for it thank god still friends with martin um and um he put me in his taxi driving and loved it absolutely loved it at the time and eventually a couple of years went by i got my own taxi then and um, got a few pounds together and got my own taxi um and i haven't stopped since um never looked back and what is it about taxis that you loved i loved it's like a confession box um you're in it on your own you have nobody telling you what to do um i can go home when i want i can work when i want um all of that was good i was nervous about the tax part of it and paying setting up a business and all of that mm. sort of stuff didn't know how to do any of that stuff whatsoever um I, I was bluffing my way through life for, from 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 a kid like and, and trying to do whatever I had to feed the kids and and mm. that was it and I had no kids at the time but to feed the family and, mm. and we just bought a house um myself and my wife eighteen years of age got me first house um and it was great I was always wanted like I, I I pictures and visions of where I wanted to to be and what we had to do and what life was all about but um I didn't realize the kick in the arse I was going to get a couple of years down the road after that um. But that, that's what taxi was. It was your own your own yeah. place and, and your own sense of this is what I'm doing now. And then you kind of feel proud of yourself because you've set up your own business. Mm. Um, when everybody else told you, like I was told in school, I'd never have anything in life. I'd never have a wife, kids, car, money, house. Uh, yeah, by, by a career guidance teacher, uh, you'll never have anything. You're a waster. Um, all this, you're nothing. And I like really put me down. Like, But it didn't affect me. Um, because and it didn't, everybody that I've said this to said to me, oh, well, maybe it spurred you on. It didn't spur me on to, to be... And, and do things I just hated him for your man for what he said to me like and absolutely and I'll never forgive him for it but look at it and it's, you know a big part of career guidance is motivating people yeah. to yeah. you know like, well, this wasn't a motivation it's <laughs> uh, weird isn't like, it like, yeah like that, um, that, that kind of comment could affect different people in different ways of course you know like, I, mean? I, I might be here today because yeah. of that yeah I'm a waster I'm a waste yeah. of space and why am I here if you're somebody that's really vulnerable um, yeah. and you're struggling at that point yeah and for someone else to say that, you're probably getting it at home and then you're getting it inside in school. That could be the turning yeah, point for someone's life. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, that, that was it. So um, I was sitting in Kilkenny one day, very quiet day, taxiing, and um, a friend of mine from Dublin pulled up in a beautiful S-Class Mercedes, top of the range Mercedes. And I looked at him and I said, where did you get that? I knew it wasn't his. And I said, what's this? Do you have to win the lottery or what? He said, no. I said, I'm chauffeur now. And I didn't know about chauffeur. Didn't know anything about it at all. And he said, um, I didn't know you were doing taxi. And I said, yeah. And he said, well, actually, he said, what are you doing next week? And I said, why? He said, we're looking for a relief driver for a week. And I started uh, that week. And I think 14 years later, I, I stopped. Um, loved it. Absolutely loved it. I became part of a team. Um, went working with, with Mick Devine. Um, Mick Devine is the celebrity chauffeur. Um, that's what he is. He's drove everybody every single person that's come to Ireland Mick mm -hmm. drives them um, and they're, they're the best chauffeur company in Ireland there's no, no doubt about it and uh, started working for them Mick taught me everything I didn't know anything about the business um, just shut your mouth put your suit on shut your mouth and don't ask questions and don't take autographs don't take photographs um, don't ask them to do whatever they want to do it and that was it um, I met everybody I've met Bob Dylan Bruce Springsteen Beyonce I've driven them all and brought Beyonce to Ballymaloo House uh, like I've met people that you would never, ever, ever dream of. Um, but what I've done was I've, I've kind of suddenly found out that because they're famous doesn't mean they're above me. Exactly. And it doesn't mean they're above anybody. And that's how I got on with them. And that's how I got on because I treat them the same as I treat you or anybody else. Mm. And I didn't care who you were. If you're a multi-billionaire, I've driven kings and, and Saudi Arabian princes. I, I don't care that they're princes. Mm. To me, they're the same as you or me or anybody else. Mm. And I've always done it that way. And that's why it worked because I showed them respect. They showed me respect. If they didn't show me respect, 
they were kind of politely told. Do you ever have any divas in the car with you? Oh, yeah, I can, but I'm, one man, and, and Irish, I'm okay. not going to say who it is, but yeah. one Irish artist, and, and that's the only person I've ever had. I've oh, always yeah. had nice people, and I can't genuinely say that. They, they've always been nice. Um, it's gas to think that... Um, Beyonce is a homemaker sandwiches with Ali Malou Relish or something. Yeah, you know? probably, yeah, probably, yeah. Um, but as I said, like, and then I learned, like, you never became their friends. They wouldn't even know who you were uh, on the second time they met you. Um, third time they met you, they wouldn't know who you were. They just, they're so used to seeing drivers that you just, you're a driver and that's all you are. Um, so you need to remember, you're not their friend, even though, oh, yes, sure, I've driven this, I've driven, they're not your friend, you're your you're paid to do it, your job. Mm. Um, so just move on and forget about it. And Would they get chatty with you? Like, could you have a conversation with them? Or well, I spoke to a lot of them about depression, um, about them being depressed. And that's when this all started to oh, kick yeah. in. And I said, well, depressed. Like they, I've, I've had artists crying in the back of the car on their own. And, and I'm driving, like looking in the mirror and what do I say? What do I do here? And I didn't know how to talk to anybody that had depression because I didn't know anything about it. Um, and I've seen like, like, multi-billionaire or millionaire people private jets the whole lot depressed out of their head um, mm. and but that's just the reality of it and that, that's what I, I want people to know that it's their lives aren't all what it's cracked mm. up to be um, they're not the Facebook is all is fake mm. the Instagram is all fake all of that is all fake life is, is real mm. um, all those social media platforms are all bullshit to be quite honest yeah, with it makes me think there a couple of weeks ago there was a documentary on RT around Johnny Cash's tour of Ireland yeah and Johnny Cash is a superstar, yeah. you know, obviously. Yeah. He came to Ireland and, you know, I suppose from the outside they're thinking, oh, Johnny Cash, yeah. the country. He was actually strung over his head on drugs yeah. and he was yeah. spiralled into his addiction driving around small gigs in Ireland, you know. Yeah. So the reality of what's going on in the car to and from the tours and the gigs, like, is, is different from well, what you actually see. Well, that's why what media. goes on in the car stays in the car and that's, that's it. Like, I, yeah. I could have shut down governments years ago if I had yeah. told what I heard in the car in my car. Yeah. Like, well, we want to destabilize the Middle East. Won't be happening, no, won't be happening, no, no, no. Um, yeah, but that, that's just, that's just the reality of it. It hits everybody. Depression hits everybody. Um, suicidal thoughts hit everybody. Um, even comedians, comedians, they, they get sick before they go on stage still and, mm -hmm. and they're at this 20 years or whatever. Like, and, yeah. uh, yeah, it's it's just it's it's a hard it's a hard place to be for them as well. Um, but that's all, but I enjoyed it. I loved it. I loved the show. From there's a very very good point to make from all what you're saying there at the moment for anyone that is listening to to it. It's that there's no need to be putting anybody up on the pedestal, no matter how much money they are or how good you think they are at singing or acting or being on stage as a comedian. Everybody is the, exactly the same when it comes to we're all made of bone, flesh, yeah. and blood. Yeah. You know, yeah. so the there's one, no the only, one better or different than anybody else. Yeah. You know, and one that's person who um, gave me a, a bit of guff, um, I was driving, I remember I was driving down the M50 and I got a belt into the back of the, pull over the car. And I said, well, I, I can't stop here. Are you okay? I said, I'll just pull in up here. And he hit the back of the headrest and uh, said, I said, pull in. Do you know who I am? And I said, well, I said, if you have your driver's license in your pocket, I said, your name is bound to be on it. I said, so I said, that'll give you a hint of who you are. I said, if you've forgotten who you are. And he just looked at me and he didn't know what to say. And because I didn't take it off him. And that was it. And that's kind of the one and only chance that, I, that I, or reason I had to say that. But I remember him getting out. I was with him for the whole day. And at the very end of it, anyway, he gets out and he says, I apologize for what I said to you. And he gave me two green hundreds uh, euro notes tip and he stuck it into my short pocket. And uh, he said, that's for yourself. I said, I'm terrible. Sorry, he said, I learned a lesson today. And I was delighted myself because I said, yeah, you should learn a lesson because you're not above everybody. Um, mm. No, they're not all Davis. They're not all. Yeah. They, they, yeah. they demand different things. Well, like, but it's all for press. It's I'd all, say yeah. when, you're, uh, when you are up on a pedestal and we, in, in our culture, Western culture, uh, we value celebrity and fame you know like we they're always in the news and you know we support them and they're millionaires and billionaires to have all the status and all the fans and everything it's very hard to keep yourself grounded when you're in that position i'd say but all you have is yes people around you and mm. you've endless resources and power and people aren't they're not used to people standing up to them so i'd say it was a reality check but that's well. that's what happens and, and i know a few drivers who kind of if you if, if you're with somebody for years, different different people coming in, um, you're with them for years. They know you. And eventually, they get to know you. They mightn't remember your name, but they get to know you. And then they start talking to you, and they talk opening in the car on their phones, and like things I shouldn't be hearing in the back of the car. They're talking about, and and mm. they they feel that they can trust you. And that's the way the Vines was. The Vines chauffeurs were 
people trusted him and they were there on time they weren't late they didn't they mm-hmm. were there they were just professional and that's why they were they got all the work so it would be cool uh, a book the secret show for no <laughs> Won't be happening. Won't be happening. I know. I know. You've told me. You know what? It's, but it, it, I'd say you've great stories. I'd, I'd say is, you've yeah, great stories. They're, 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 they're not just stories. They're life lessons. Yeah. I learned from them. I learned an awful lot from them. Um, yeah. And when people say to me, oh, it must be brilliant. And you're looking around and you're saying, no, it's not really brilliant. Because like, you have a perspective on celebrity yeah. that nobody has, really. Yeah, your life is brilliant at the moment. Whether you know it or not, your life is brilliant. And you don't think it's brilliant because you haven't got this, you haven't got that. Um, but trust me, your life is a lot better than his or hers. And mm. I know it is because I've been with them. Like, um, and, and yeah, and things like that. Um, that's the way it was. That's, that's, that's the way I came into it. Um, kept chauffeuring. And if I wasn't busy chauffeuring, I jumped back into my taxi and I remember one night I was in Kenny taxi and um, got rear-ended, a drunk driver. I had two passengers in the back of the car actually. Um, I came around the corner and there was a guard at checkpoint and I, I said in my own mind, what a stupid place to have a guard at checkpoint, right on a bit of a bend and I was sitting there and next minute just bang, this car hit me and I said I knew it. I just knew it was a dangerous place to be and I got out of the car, I went back, this woman was absolutely plastered. Uh, legless couldn't even open so i opened the door and she fell out onto the ground um and i put my hand in to turn off the key and i think the guard that was there thought i was going to hit the person and grab my arm and bent it around my back and i said i'm turning off the ignition because the woman's foot was one foot was still in, yeah. in the car on the ignition on the accelerator so um got her they arrested her and brought her off i dropped the two people home bumper was hanging off i dropped the two people home um Went back home that night, pissed off because it was a Saturday night and it was half 12 or 1 o'clock or whatever it was. And sure, the best part of the night was happening. I lost me, lost the whole night's work. Went home, went to the beach the next day, Sunday morning. Sunday, the sun was splitting the rocks. Went down to Wexford, um, diving into the sea. Kids were burying me um, at this height. Kids at this stage, burying me in the sand. Um, this was in 2010. And um, came back and pains me back and I said look I'm going to go to the doctor I said because obviously the insurance company are going to want to go blah 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 mm. went out to the hospital casually next minute I was in the x-ray machine and your woman hits this button and told me not to move she said you'd be paralysed for the rest of your life and I was there looking at her and I said I'm grand love I must have been swimming all day um, and she says don't move and I lit on the oak and I'm sure I froze then and I just stuck there they came in they put collars on me and the whole lot and I had a broken neck and a broken back according Jeez, to the to the man. radiologist Um so in an ambulance, and I tell you, if, if, if for anybody that hasn't been in an ambulance, if I hadn't got a broken back in the ambulance uh, or beforehand, I said definitely didn't go down to Waterford. It hopped all around the road, <laughs> but it was horrible. And I was, I was tied down and all. I, I felt absolutely terrible. And the pain was getting worse because I was braced. Um, got to Waterford anyway and turned out my neck wasn't broken, thank God. But I had um, damaged my lower back. Um, so I said, right, what do I do now? So um, Ryan pain was unbearable so they put me on medication and took the medication it was grand oxycontins didn't know anything about them never lovely. heard of them before in my life lovely as right they were absolutely <laughs> brilliant um <laughs> and went in kept getting uh, i got an epidural into the back let's see what that stopped the pain nothing happened so thank god i had vhi and um the only thing i've ever paid for in my life and and never would continue to pay it even if i was hungry i'd pay me vhi before i pay mm. um and went in anyway um, went to the Hermitage in Dublin, met uh, Dr. Nagaria, and he said, um, I'll operate on you. I'm the best in the world. And he said, you can take that to the bank. He said, I'm telling you, I'm the best. He said, I'll fix you. And I was in agony. Two legs were going down. Um, started to feel bad then because I wasn't working. I couldn't work then. From 2010 to 2014, I didn't work. Um, done bits in between. And I had, I'd, I had had pubs then um, in between. When I started chauffeuring, I was making a few quid. And I got a pub. Um, and I was running the pub and my brother was running my parents were in it um, and it was hard it, w- it was hard working the pub and lifting kegs and all that sort of stuff so I, when I started chauffeuring and get busier I'd go away and then they just run the pub and I didn't have anything to do with it so I, I had no interest in the pub but I learned in, in the pub like I met a lot, a lot of people that were in there drinking every day and I was the type of person I wasn't kind of I won't say I was a bad person but I, I didn't have sympathy years ago for people and I wouldn't have had if you had to pull across me in a car I'd have went around you and probably pulled you out of the car and, and said, what are you on about? And I'd mm. start giving out you and all that. Now I don't do that because I don't know what that person's gone through. I've, mm. my whole, I'm delighted that I got depression. That sounds really bad. Yeah. Um, I can understand it's that, It's yeah. absolutely after changing my whole entire life, um, the way I, I thought about things, the way I thought about other people. And yeah, that, that's, that's what it's done. It's changed my life completely. It and, just and opened your eyes up to 
to the life really and, yeah and, and how much of a dickhead I would probably be yeah. and, 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 and cop on to myself and, and like you can't treat people this way and all that sort of stuff and I'd be nice as pie to other people and people would know and something could turn on me then I'd just snap and, and yeah. I was just I wasn't a nice person to be around some of the time um, do you know when you were out for the four years um, were you taking the Oxycontin through the whole time no what happened I got Oxycontin at the start then uh took me off them and put me on other painkillers. I said, you don't need them anymore. But I still didn't know anything about oxygen at the time. Um, went to the Hermitage in Dublin, got the operation on my back and they pumped Oxycontin into me in the hospital because I was after getting the surgery on the back. Um, it was horrible. The pain was unbearable um, going in for the surgery. And I remember waking up the next day, no pain, completely and utterly gone after the operation. And I went, happy days. I said, I'm sorted. I said, this is brilliant. Um, then they started filling me. I was like getting sore then again, not as bad as I was. The pain mm-hmm. was gone out of my legs completely. In- instantly, overnight, it was gone over the operation. And start pumping the Oxycontins into me and Oxynorm. I was taking both of them. Um, Again, as I said, I didn't realise what they were. I didn't realise they were uh, as a hillbilly heroin, as people were calling yeah. them. And I, I only found out all this now. Um, so I took the tablets and couldn't go to the toilet. Um, I was in the in, in the hospital trying to go to the toilet and I just wasn't able. So they said, right, we're going to take you off the Oxycontins. They copped on that they were after giving me too much. Um, and now I was asking for it. It wasn't their fault. I was asking for it every day. Never realised I was hooked. Mm. Hadn't a clue I was hooked. And uh, took the tablets got the operation went home was lying in the bed um couldn't move in the, in the bed i was i was real stiff uh, after the operation and i was trying to walk again it was hard and next minute i got a bang on the door and i, I it took me 10 minutes to go to the door and i have two fellas at the door trying to take the house off me um they were repossessing the house because i hadn't paid the mortgage and i said but i pay my protection on my my mortgage and they said oh no you're self-employed you shouldn't have got paying protection you, we missed all your paying protection and i said well that's not my problem lads so more to with them anyway um and I fought the bank and um, eventually I got it. Thank God I got it sorted. Thank God. Um, but I was at my worst. I was starting to get at me where I was going downhill rapidly. Mm. And here's these where I know as well. And I had to ring the bank down and tell them. So I rang the bank and said, look, so I'm depressed down my head. I'm not talking. Didn't care. Didn't want to talk to me. Didn't want to help me. Um, just no interest. Just pay your mortgage or get out. And that, that was it. So I'd only built a new house at this stage. Um, built a brand new house a couple of years out in, in Callum where I live now. So... Uh, I thought my operation was grand. So I was driving one day. I had to go in to, to get the stitches removed from my back. I uh, shouldn't have drove, but I had nobody else to drive. My wife was gone to work. But as I as I went into the hospital or the doctors, um, I started getting dizzy and pains in my head. And it was, it, was like, it was like I was being hit with a hammer. Absolutely throbbing, the head was. So I was driving into town. Eyesight went completely as I was driving the car. I couldn't see a thing. So I knew where I was. I got my senses and I put my foot in the brake pulled the car into the thank God where I was I knew I, I just knew where I was and I could pull over to the side and stopped and a truck came up behind me I could hear the horn beep and I said right he's going to just ram me now from behind um, driver got out came up asked me what the hell are you doing and I said I can't see called an ambulance um, brought me out to the hospital again lying in the bed in the hospital um, lay down there love you you'd be grand so I lay down and Jesus a few minutes later I could start to see again and I was like I thought I was gone blind and I said thank God and I said visions of something snapped in me back a cord that, that's mm-hmm. connected to your eyes um, now you're blind yeah, and yeah. I said Jesus Christ that's all I need now um, went to the hospital lay down there but while I was, I was fluid I ran the hospital in Dublin um, that had done it I was supposed to go back up the next day for a checkup, and I ran them and said look I won't be up Tomorrow, Debbie, I said, um, I said, I'm in hospital here. My back is killing me. And I said, I can't see. And I went back. She hung up the phone. And I said, the cheek of her. I said, I thought then she was giving out because I didn't give her enough notice to cancel the open. They were looking for their 200 quid or whatever the consultation mm-hmm. fee was. So um, she, the doctor, Nagaria, who done my back, rang me. And he said, come up straight away. He said, um, you need to have an operation. And he rang me himself direct. And I said, no, sure, I'm grand. I'm in hospital. I said, I know they're looking after me here. And he said, no, he said, you need to have Eocus. And so I went up anyway, into the lift, down the lift, straight into the anaesthetist, knocked out, another operation, opened me up again and done it. Uh, I had lo- fluid inside, it was leaking, it was going up around my brain. Um, and he said, it would be serious damage if I hadn't, have, hadn't have had that operation. Mm-hmm. So that was the second operation. So woke up, a friend of mine um, who chauffeured with me, his wife uh, went in to get her knee done. No depression, um, involved in the troubles all her life up the north um, with her family and all that. She, she was one of the women who, who started the troubles, to be quite honest with you, and she done the, the, the real work up there. Mm. Um, she was in hospital with me, Anne. And uh, 
she went down and got operation. I got up the operation. Two of us were depressed. Oh, instantly. Never had it before. Um, couldn't say why. My mother had said to me, going in, you want to watch that operation? She said, in case you get some depression around that. Because mom had an operation and she got a bit of depression out. And I said, ah, yeah, it'd be grand. She didn't know about, about depression. Do you want to explain, like, you uh, say you got depression, but do you want to tell us what the reality of that, like what it was like on a daily basis? The reality of it was I didn't want to be around. Um, I, I, I didn't know why I was sad. Um, after the second operation, I went home. And I started to get better. Um, and I said, I'll be able to go back to work now. Um, this is after the second operation. So I decided to, to go back to work um, and told my wife I was going back to work. So what I would do is I'd get up in the morning. She'd get up in the morning. The kids get ready for school. They go out the gate. They go left. I go right. And when she went around the bend, I reversed back into the driveway and got into bed in a pair of underpants and bawled my eyes out for the day and stayed there for nearly a year. Couldn't get, couldn't leave the bedroom for a year and I pretended I was going to work. And that's how all the problems started mm-hmm. with the mortgage and with money coming in. And mm-hmm. I was pretending I was working and I had money, thank God. Um, but I, I couldn't keep going the way I was going and I started, eventually had to run. And I was ashamed. Uh, I couldn't tell anybody. I was like, I'm the man of the house, right? Mm. too good for this to be telling people I'm depressed and I'm crying and all that how, how can you do that um, why did my wife marry me why did she marry someone that was normal um, why, why why me I'm a mental case she doesn't deserve me the kids are going to grow up now with a father that's mental This is, everything bad goes through not, not, not a positive thought goes through your head um, this went through, through my head and, and every day it was kicking me and kicking me and kicking me um, and I just didn't want to get out of bed I didn't want to go I, I'll tell you the gospel I was lying in the bed here a en suite in the, in the bedroom. The door was two arms lengths away into the en suite bathroom and I was going in the bucket because I was couldn't get out of bed to go to the toilet. Nobody knew that. Yeah. Um, I'll be honest with you, I think this is probably the first time I've ever said it, but I want this to be honest. So um, I, I, I was going to toilet in the bucket because I was too, and then I'd get up in the evening at 10 to 6 before Sharon would come off from work and I'd get dressed and I'd walk around the house and say, how you doing, pet? How's things? And I said, mm-hmm. what the hell is going on? And I didn't know where I was, but that's how I felt. It brought me down so low and made me feel useless, made me yeah. feel every single thing that was wrong with me. Um, didn't want to eat. Um, and then I wanted to eat all day. Uh, and and it was just, it was, it was a horrible place to be in. So uh, eventually I said, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? And my back started to get sore. So I was going for a third operation. So I went in for the third operation. Um, came back out and that was it I knew this is the end of that I'm finished uh, back as grand but I said I can't keep going on like this and I was on Oxycontins I was popping them I was eating I'd say I was drinking 10-15 Oxycontins a day I don't know how I'm alive mm. um, so that's just like heroin in a pill form yeah uh, but I didn't know that and nobody told me they were addictive not one my own doctor who Dr. Lee who was a fantastic man um, didn't tell me they were addictive just gave them to me and the, the hospital just kept giving me, your mom kept coming over and handing me a drink them. I said, thank you. So I, didn't, I didn't even know. I, I trusted them because that's what mm-hmm. I thought. So I took the tablets. Um, but then I got hooked on them and I loved them. I absolutely loved them. They were the best thing I've ever, I never, I never done cocaine. Genuinely, mm-hmm. I've never done uh, I've weed. I've never done any yeah. of that. But Oxycontin was absolutely brilliant. Mm-hmm. Um, I wouldn't recommend it for people because, uh, and anybody now that I, that says I'm on Oxycontin, um, my, my neighbor down the road was in a, an accident and he's actually on Oxycontin. I said, look, watch them. I said, they're dangerous. And mm-hmm. he wasn't told about them being addictive. Um, but I told him and I was just so delighted and happy on him. And I, well, it's all I was, but all I was doing was masking what was going on I, mm. and, and kill or hiding what was going on. But my wife was able to say to me, you didn't take your tablets because she knew. And that's me, didn't even register that there was something different in my, in my attitude. So um, I kept taking tablets and then I went to the hospital one day and they cut me off them. But I wasn't weaned off them. I was just, they said, you don't need them anymore. And I was the pain gone. I said, it is, yeah. I said, I don't, I don't have much pain, but no which I was, didn't. No wonder it's gone. Of course the pain is gone. <laughs> I, was the <laughs> yeah, I was on my head on tablets. I was eating them like Skittles. Now, you the good thing was... probably floating around. Yeah, I was floating around the place. But I, I actually have a video of me sitting at the kitchen table when it got really bad. And I was just looking around me like this and I was just staring into space. I was stoned out of my head. Um, so I, I kept taking them. But then when I got cut off, I said, what am I going to do? And I was driving a back, back driving taxi then, um, an odd few nights, just to get in a few quid. And this woman came up and she was 70. And she said, how is the back? And I said, ah, I'm grand now. I said, it's, it's killing me. I said, I'm still on painkillers. I said, I actually have to get more oxycontins. Oh, I got them, she said. And I said, did you? And it twigged with me. And she became a drug dealer. 
I yeah. became yeah, the yeah. seventy year old woman became the woman I was given money to for my medication. So my drug dealer, you have visions of a drug dealer mm. being out there, whatever, yeah, yeah. Uh, whatever picture you have of a drug dealer it wasn't a seventy year old uh, grandmother from 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 a housing estate. So I was going down to her giving her twenty quid for a box of tablets. She was all over the moon with herself. Um, and then her doctor said, hold on a minute, what's all these tablets for? And he stopped giving it to her. So I had to find out. She told me her friend would get them for me, right? And because she thought she was helping me out. It was, and I was helping her out with the money. She was helping me out with the tablets. But it wasn't because I was addicted to them. She didn't know I was addicted to them. She was giving them to me because she thought I needed them to stop the pain. And that's what she thought she was helping me, um, which she wasn't. She was actually making it 10, ten times worse. Now, what kind of... Uh what what kind of a strength were they and how many were you taking a day how bad did it get for you uh, I could take up to 10 a day 10, 15 a day it depends what are they oak. and mm. I don't know how I oak. Um, yeah. I, I, I noticed I was starting shaking um, and all that but if I, not if I took them if I took them I was okay Yeah. Um, and how I, how I got off them was I, I went to a, a trade fair in, in the UK somebody else was supposed to be go uh, go with his son and he couldn't Barry my friend the oak, and he couldn't go and I went with his, with his son and I was in bed that night and it was like that I forgot mm. my tablets. It's horrible, I horrible me, feeling. Well, it is when you're in England. Yeah. Uh, and the I didn't realize. The so nightmares you have coming along off from me. Everything. Every, well, the whole team went yeah. to me. All I wanted to do was get home to my own bed um, and get into that bed and just stay there on my own, pull the covers over until mm. this ends. I didn't know what it was. And I actually came off them um, and I, I got them at home and I had them beside me in, in, in the dash of the car and I went into town one night to collect a uh, taxi, work taxi, and there was a chap in there. And he get into the car, and it was it was one of these look as all taxi drivers do it. They do drug runs. We, we yeah. you go to somebody's house. I forgot my phone. Um, yeah. It's amazing because you're the fiftieth person today to go to that house. Love that. Is, Man, he's a taxi. I was in like that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so, yeah. Four yeah. o'clock in, in the morning. I just go home to the shop there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> from skins. I, I, we know, but look at. Yeah. I'm not the one to to criticize anybody or judge anybody. So. Well. We didn't do it, and uh, yeah, man saw my. I had four oxycontin. And it was the last four I had and they were on the dash and your mum was there and he was staring down at the yokes and I said is he going to rob me phone or what's he looking at here I didn't know what he was and I copped in and I said it's a tablet so um, <laughs> he said to me yeah so he said to me uh, what's the story of the tablets and I went oh, I said I need them from my back because I actually finished them off them today and he goes yeah he said I have an awful pain in my back myself he said and I copped it said, no he's not he's, he's, there's something wrong here um, so I said right don't bullshit I said what's the story and he goes he said I crush him he said, I'm, he said I'm highly addicted to him he said, he said that's where I'm going now to get other stuff and that's blah, what blah, we blah. used to do as well we used to get Oxycontin too from certain people yeah. um, but they are, we used to get 20s they were kind of like an orangey peachy colour mine were orange peachy colour right? yeah. they're the ones I was well, on yeah. it does a time release on them yeah they're, so they're cultured you, yeah exactly so when you crush them up and snort them that's what we used to do with them. I didn't know that yeah. thank god I didn't know that because yeah. I probably would have been honest yeah, yeah, know, yeah, because yeah. I was getting such a bang out of them and, yeah. and they were great but uh, yeah so that's that's what happened he, he gave me them um, but so after the third operation, and Anne as well, um, Anne went on to, to take her own life um, with depression. And that stemmed from coming out of the hospital with me. Yeah. Um, and that's when suicides became real. Uh, mm. in my, and I was already in a bad place. And Anne was ringing me because she, she could talk to me because I was talking to her in the hospital and she knew me. Mm. And I, I tried everything to talk to her, but I didn't know how to help people. That were, I just kept talking to her and said, look, you'll be okay. It'll, it'll be grand and all that. And, and, and she took her life. Um, sad and I'm, it's just it was just awful just absolutely awful that's very sad yeah it was very sad but it, it was when it could have been prevented mm. um and look at it for another day what happened but yeah. um she went for help and, and, and didn't get it um oh, yeah. but yeah that that was that was what it was um but i went back to work eventually and anyway, i got off the tablets um had to go back to work i was up to me tonsils in debt at the time and people were in me looking for money at left right and center bills um, revenue, market, everything, everything went wrong. Um, went back to work. First night back to work, man standing on the bridge. Um, I didn't know what to do. Didn't, I had no training at all in anything. Um, I'd never done anything in my education in my life. All I was was going to be a tax driver for the rest of my life and that was it. Happy out. And I stopped the car in the middle of the road because I knew this man was going to feel like I, I didn't care how bad or the traffic was behind me. I just stopped. I got out. Everybody around him was oblivious to me I, or to me I didn't even see them I just saw them standing there but I didn't realise two bouncers had talk him trying to get him off the bridge talking to him and I just walked straight into the storm straight into the middle of him and said look get down I said I'll talk to you 
I said, and get into the car. And he got down, get into the car and closed the door. And he said to me, he said, you haven't a clue, he said, how I'm feeling. And I said, I didn't say I know how you feel. I said, but I know how I felt, I said, for the last couple of months. And he said, yeah, but the bank is not trying to take your house. And I said, well, actually they are, I said. Um, and we just clicked. So I kept talking to him, but the guards were on the way. Um, guards came and took him. And I, he said, thanks very much for crying. And he just went off. Uh, guards took him. I went off, I was shaking. I didn't know what to do or what to say to myself. I was, I was shaken. Um, went off, I said, right, I better go back to work. Turned around, went back down the town. An hour later, over the same bridge, another man on the bridge. Two men one night, um, called the guards. Same two guards arrived, they couldn't believe us. They said, no, you're joking me. And I said, the same, there's another fella here on the bridge. So I asked him what was wrong. I got out and I spoke, spoke to him, um, stopped again in the middle of the bridge and got out and spoke to him. And he said that he couldn't see his kids and his wife or girlfriend had said you're not going to ever see him again blah 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 and he said what's the point anymore and he thought he was going to take his own life um got him off the bridge he hugged me and squeezed my neck and if my back wasn't bad enough he would have to squeeze me with, with saying thank you so much and blah blah, blah. The guards took him brought him for help so i panicked and i went home i had enough that night i went home didn't care about money i went home and said what if i had said something different and they jumped Mm. how would I live with that because of me they jumped and all oh, this it's my fault and I told them to jump and all everything was going through my head so um, I wanted to see was there any training that I could get how do you talk to people like that what do you say to people and this is how Taxi Watch came about um, I went off and the HSE were doing a safe talk course and an assist course um, later on I went on to do the assist course yeah, I did both of them as yeah. well the assist was very good yeah assist was brilliant yeah the yeah. safe talk was, was good at the time because I had never done anything else so mm. I just I, I, I thought it was good um, but it teaches you how to spot people who are suicidal how to talk to them um, what to say to them what not to say to them the words to use um, not to say the words committed suicide you, it's, it's an awful thing to say so somebody committed suicide they didn't they commit, you commit crimes you don't commit suicide that's a legacy um, of the Catholic Church like really yeah, isn't it yeah yeah. so people like, I would never say committed and not time I might let it slip out yeah, um, yeah. But I, I, and I feel terrible for it but um, people die by suicide they don't commit suicide um, and learn all these things and I found it excellent I found it absolutely excellent it was a, a, and there was a course coming up but that course was coming up um, and John Kennedy was the, the trainer um, and he uh, Caroline Clifford was a lady in Kilkenny in GAA and I ran her he, say, he said to me we have a course coming up in the GAA club he said see can you get on that so I ran Caroline and she's no problem she said absolutely come on board and do it and I was delighted because I had no involvement in GAA or anything like that I hate GAA um, so I went done the course and found it brilliant and they said to me on that course there's an assist course went and done that found that absolutely excellent um, found it tougher much tougher um, we actually had an inspector from the guards there that day mm. he was doing the assist course and he actually stood up and stormed out crying uh, mm. and it's couldn't a tough, finish the, it's yeah. a tough train and I he, did it over two days over the new CC yeah. there, it's a applied suicide intervention yeah. so it's not just about spotting it it's about giving you the tools and there's a specific protocol you take when dealing with somebody that you think is at risk yeah. of suicide i actually have it in me wallet still for the last five or six yeah, years yeah. a little booklet you know and i've used it you know if somebody came to me and they were suicidal i said do you mind if i just take out the book because there's you don't want yeah. to say the wrong thing at the wrong time yeah, yeah that's kind yeah. of it, like, like little things like it can be uh, a heavy training yeah, they like, can't it like, oh it's definitely well well what i saw an inspector from the guards going out i just thought these lads are supermen they should know these things yeah and, but they don't the guard, i didn't never realize the guards don't have any training i, I mm -hmm. only found out all this later on um but yeah so so done that course and i came back to the canyon and I said, jesus i wonder like i've done this for myself um i wasn't about anybody else and i wasn't setting up anything i had no intention of setting up anything i wanted this for myself to cover me me in case something happened again or i came across it so I said, I wonder what other taxi drivers like to do it. So I asked, um, at the time, sorry, I was, I was depressed. I was still depressed, even though I was doing this course. And I had told nobody that I, that I was depressed at all, not even my wife. Um, and I can tell her anything. I can tell her I'm about to kill somebody and she wouldn't say it to me. Um, so you were off the meds at this stage. I was you? off it now. Yeah. I was off mm -hmm. the Oxycontin at this stage and I was trying to just trying to get back to work, but I was still, I was on medication yeah. uh, for my back. Um, or for my depression I, I, what happened was um, I, I went to Dublin I went down to a bridge the first time I, I went down to the bridge um, and I stood on the bridge and I just had enough I, I just had enough at this stage and I, I didn't want to do it anymore and I just felt so low and it was really really low um, and I stood on the bridge and I let go of the bridge it took me ages I, I, tears were pouring down my face and I held on to the, to the bridge and um, I was looking into the water and the water was like it was mad. It was like, come on, jump. Come on in here. It'd be lovely in here. And all your problems will go away if you come in here now. 
come on, kept calling me. And I, this little fucker, as I call him, on my shoulder, shouting at me, you're useless. You're, mm. uh, you've, you have no hope in life. Look at you. You're a waste of space. You're this or that. And he was screaming in my ear. And the water's calling me at this stage. Now, this sounds mental, but this is what happened. The water's calling me. He's screaming in my ear to jump. And eventually, I just said, right here. And I just let go. And the second I let go, he fecked off, gone. The water stopped calling me. And next minute, I got dragged back over the bridge. And I was on the ground in a heap. And I was 23 stone when, mm-hmm. I, when I decided to do this. And I didn't know what was after to happen. And I turned around and there's this little small man. I wouldn't say he was five foot. And he's standing there and he pulled me over that bridge. And I hated him for it. Mm. Absolutely hated him for it. Um, I wanted to go that day. I wanted to go. I'm going to start crying now. Um, yeah. I wanted to go that day. Yeah. And he pulled me over the bridge. And uh, <clears throat> sorry, no. Okay, so, yeah, take yeah. your time. So I knew this would happen. So um, that was grand. So I, I just started crying and I put my hand on my head and I was crying. And when I looked up, he was gone. There was no one there. And I was back on my own. And I thought about going over again. And I said, no, here, look, it's some sort of a sign. Go home. So I went home, told nobody again, didn't tell anybody that I was, I was uh, after doing it. And I was delighted that nobody saw me or whatever. But I was on a big bridge in the middle of the Kenny, like, uh, like cars were driving past and... All this. And actually, the, the man that I had stopped uh, from jumping that before or afterwards, people were jumping past, beeping at him, saying, jump, you clown, jump, and shouting at him out the window of the car, beep, thought it was great crack. And the man was on a bridge trying to take his life. And mm-hmm. I just couldn't get that into my head. What is wrong with you? Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I probably would have taken the head off him. I didn't care how big he was. Uh, just beeping at him, jumping and laughing. And, and like, so that was great. So I went home. Um, Told nobody, didn't tell a, a sin, uh, a sinner, and went home two weeks later. I was still crying every day, crying every day, didn't want to be around, didn't want to do this. Went back down to the bridge, a different bridge, because I said, I'm going to be seen, or that yoke will come up and try and stop me again. And I was on the bridge, and I put my foot over the, 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 the railings, and uh, a guard of car stopped on the bridge and looked at me. And I got back over the bridge, and he drove off and left me standing there. Didn't get out of the car and ask me, Am I all right? He just stopped to look at me to say, You're not going to do that. And I looked at him and he said, right, well, help me then. I need help. I don't know what to do. I don't know where to go for help. I don't know who to ask. And he just, they just drove off the two guards sitting in the car. I, couldn't, I was shocked. Couldn't believe it. Um, now, I've told the superintendent since because I have a great relationship with the guards at the beginning. Um, I know down here now you don't always have in Nocknahini. You mightn't have a great yeah. relationship with them. But I've never had that in my good things with them. I, I didn't have them raid my house. I didn't have any of that mm. badness coming kind of come in. And some guards are good, some guards are, are bad. I understand that. Um, but these two drove off and left me in the bridge. So I said, right. So I went home that night and started to feel a bit better, a small bit better, not not much. And I was on um, depression medication at that time still. So I got into the car anyway and I, I rang Mick and I said, uh, chauffeur, I said, Mick, I said, I'm, I'm ready to go back to work there. Everything's sound. Nobody knew anything about me. So I went back to work. Uh, I was driving an artist all day. Um, and next day then I went back up and I was going up and I'm always early. I don't do late for chauffeur because you have one chance. If you mess up once, you're gone. And that, that's just the reality of the business. So I've never been, ever been late for a client ever in 14 years. Like, So I'd always be way early. Like I even here today, I was a half an hour early. Like, uh, I, that's just the way I am. Mm-hmm. So I was sitting in the car um, and I was five minutes from, from the lockup to get to, to pick up the Merc to go and collect somebody. And Mick rang me, he said, Derek, Derek, he said, listen, he said, where are you? And I said, I'm up. He said, I knew you'd be early. He said, there's someone at the airport. He said, um, they ordered a different car from somebody else. And he said, they need to be picked up. Can you fly out? And I said, yeah, no bother. So I ran over, jumped in half an hour early, sped out the gate, um, passed the driver on the way. Never saw the driver before in my life. He, he was wearing the same tie that we all have. Um, and so I, I knew he was one of our drivers. And next minute I got a phone call from the boss's son screaming at me on the phone that I was after driving out of the lockup sideways on two wheels, nearly killed an old woman walking on the road and all this. And I said, no. I said, and I said, that, that's your man. I said, it's after reading and saying I've done all this. I said, what's going on? And I was here there for years mm-hmm. with him then. So um, I picked up the phone and I rang him. I said, I got his number and I said, did you ring? He said, I did, yeah, the speed you're going out. And he started shouting, screaming at me, you fat bastard, he called me. And I said, no, I was heavy at the time. And I would never, you could call me anything you want. I've never been, mm. uh, don't care what anybody calls me. Um, but this, bang, put a click in my head and snapped. I was going to kill him. And I genuinely, as true as I'm sitting here, I want to take that fella's life. Mm. And I get into the car and I drove out to the person. I got my client that I had to catch, um, got him out of there, got him to the hotel. And then I grabbed my phone and I locked on. And we had um, 
tracker system for every vehicle. So if we had two or three cars and say for argument's sake you were driving an artist and they said, Where's the second car? I say, There you go, it's, it's coming up on Collins Street. Now it'll be here with us in two minutes. And I could see exactly where so we had all that, it was a brilliant system. Um and I could see where your man was. So I rang him and I told him I shouldn't have rang him, but thank God I did because I, uh, he wouldn't be around today. But um, I rang him and I said, uh, you stay where you are. I said, I can see you're outside the hotel. I said, I'm on my way to get you. I said, when I get you, you're dead. And I got the wheel brace out of the car. The boot. I wasn't like this at all. Like, <laughs> this not me at all. Like, went. It just snapped. Yeah. And um, I was after being in third operation, severe depression, severe everything. Wanted to kill myself twice. And I got into the car and I went after him. And... Uh, he was gone. He said he started driving. So it was like watching the yoke. It was like something you see in the films. You could see all these lions, cars going out and around chasing them. So uh, Colin rang me and said, Derek, what the name of Christ is going on? He said, will you stop? He said, you're going to kill him. And I said, I'm going to kill him. And I was bawling. The tears were pissing down my face. Um, and if I got, I, genuinely, if I had got him, I'd have killed him. So Colin calmed me down. I remember going down through the port tunnel. I think it must have been down about 200 kilometres an hour and then the brand new S-Class Mercedes, top of the range, 140 grand's worth of a car, um, driving down the road. And I got to the end of the, t- the oak. They wouldn't let me out. The barrier wouldn't let me out. Um, they obviously known I had been speeding in or something, they, but they, the blocked, feckin' van pulled in behind me and blocked me in the, into the uh, toll bridge. Wouldn't let me out. Um, and I was there, right, I'm going through this barrier. It's not my car. I couldn't care less. I just had to get your man to kill him. So I said, let me through or I'm going to, I'm going to ram the barrier. I said, I'm telling you now I will. So she let up the barrier anyway and let me do it. I was genuinely going to do it. So I went down anyway and kept looking for your man. And Colin was calming me down on the phone and I was on the phone. And, I, and at the time, I wasn't even in a car kit. I was there, yeah, I was driving around Dublin City with my phone up to my ear for, for ages. So drove back to the yard anyway, um, parked the car, threw the keys over the wall, 140 grand car, threw the keys over the wall, didn't even put them back in the box where they're supposed to go, got into my own car and headed for Kilkenny. And decided that going home that day that the next truck that I see, I'm going straight into it. I was insured. Generally got all the money. The house be paid for. All the bills would be gone because I, I died. Nobody would know it's suicide because it was only an accident. And I said, I'm going to do it. So I was driving along anyway. Um, first truck I saw. I said, right, here we go. Dropped the gear anyway, heading for the truck. And I looked and I saw Lucy on the front of the truck. And straight away I said, daughter, the driver's daughter. And I, I curled up because I remember seeing... Eddie Stobart's trucks have all the names of the daughters on the mm-hmm. door. And I said, no, I'm going to head for this truck now. And I saw the name, uh, backed off, didn't do it. Said, I'll do the next one. And I, whatever comes around the corner, for bread van, whatever it is, I'm going into it. And next thing that came around the corner was a school bus, yellow school bus. And I said, right, that's, can't do that. And I said, that's the end of it. And I just burst into tears again. And headed for Kilkenny. Don't remember any of the journey home. Don't remember uh, anything at all complete and utter fuzz the whole way to Kilkenny and I said I'm fucked I need help and I went to the doctor and Dr Lee uh, hit the ground bawled my eyes out and just I, I feel like I was there for about two hours um, the doctor at the time wasn't a doctor that you could kind of I didn't think I could talk to um, he was a type of man that would he was very quiet he never said a whole lot of words when you go into him and he just stood there and just looked at me and let me cry and cry and cry and cry. And that was the best release I got. Um, and I'd finally told somebody that, I, you know, and it was like, I always, it's like somebody had been parked on my chest and they reversed off it. And just the pressure came off my chest. He knew now. So I'm about to tell somebody. So what do I do now? So he um, organized a counselor um, in medication. I was on the medication. And I'm probably juggling the story around a small bit, but anyway. Fine. Um, so kept taking the medication felt great after two weeks on the medication the depression medication felt really really good um, much better than it was so wanted to tell people and I didn't know what to do and I did not I had to tell my wife I didn't know how to tell her I, I, I couldn't tell her so I rang the radio station local radio station and I said um, I have a bit of a story for you if you don't mind me telling you about mental health and they said alright so they brought me on and I told the whole of Kilkenny um instantly that I had depression and I tried to kill myself and told them all told, told them the story um next day I won't say the shit hit the fan but everything everything happened um and all good things started happening um my wife knew about us and went and got the help went and got the counselling um that's when it all started to turn around everything started to turn around from that and I, I know and I, I sit here honestly and say to people counselling doesn't help 
everybody and medication doesn't help everybody um everybody has to get their own way of of yeah. getting help um but it worked both of them work for me and I, I found the counseling absolutely fantastic so i went um went on then after that and um after the counseling i kept I kept going to the council kept going counseling and the only reason i kept going was uh, another reason was the insurance company insisted that i was going to my solicitor had to because i, I the, obviously the claim gone in against for my accident but Everybody, nobody could see my pain. Nobody could see my back pain because I was—I didn't get an arm chopped off. I didn't get a leg chopped off, but I was in agony, absolute agony. And I remember being in the pub one night and I wasn't drinking heavy. I was in for one or two drinks and um, somebody was there and there was an ad on the television about fake claims and your man with the collar on him and uh, he puts his hand in your pocket. You ever see that ad? Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. And next minute, hey Derek, you're on the telly. And I turned around like that and I, I was in bits now. And I turned around like that and I looked up and I just burst into tears and walked out of that pub and walked home. Um, and this person didn't do this. He was just messing. Yeah. And, and I took it to heart because nobody believed me that I was sore. Nobody. You know, then I went to the high court with this. After three operations. Yeah, yeah. But you see, I, I, all I was short to do was drop my pants and showing them. Like, um, And then I went to the solicitors. I went to the high court and their solicitors didn't believe me. They thought I was pulling a stroke and pulling a scam and all that. What was the high court for? I had to go to, I went to the high court. The, the, even though the person was drunk. The person was responsible. Oh, yeah. Everything was gone on. It was their fault. Nothing to do with me. I had four guards as witnesses. Oh, from the crash. From like, the crash. Yeah, yeah. Everything was there. But yet, they 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 didn't take blame for it. So, uh, that was it. They, they In the high court, they, um, obviously, the, the case was settled and I went home. Loads of money. And I was still at home, bawling, crying over money problems, worrying about money and the money was there. Um, the day, actually, I was in the high court, we were... It was Cork. Um, Bruce Springsteen was in Cork. Oh, yeah, and I was yeah. on that tour we'd done the whole of Ireland. Um, so I, I left it to come up to the high court. And I came out of the high court that day and I let a scream out of me. I was on my own. Nobody was with me. And I was on my own. And I let a scream out of me in Smithfield, in right in the middle of where, near where I parked. And I let this scream because it was over. And they dragged it on for four years. And it was four years that I could have been dead. Mm. Um None of them give a shit. That's what they were probably hoping for. They were for. probably hoping. That's exactly what I... I convinced of that. That's exactly what it is. Um, they didn't care about me. No, the solicitors in there that day didn't care about me. They, they didn't care about my mental health. They didn't care about that. And my own solicitor knew the problems I was going through because it was his counsellor or his counsellor that, that were, they were paying for the counselling. Like, um, but even to go to the counselling, the counselling was €120 Euros a session. I didn't know there was free counselling around the place. Did you want to be making another no that, no money. Yeah, I had no money. I had 40 minutes for 120 euros. But I went in anyway, um, and he turned around and he said to me, can you afford this? And I said, no. I said, I don't have any money. I said, I'm, I'm skint. And he goes, right. He said, when you get sorted, he said, um, tell your solicitor to pay me. And that was the best deal that this man could. He, he helped me unbelievably. He doesn't know how much. Because I was thinking, I, I can't keep coming to you. I don't have the money. Like, mm. um, And he said, tell your sister to get me paid. And he did. And he, and he was brilliant. Dr. Tim Dunn in um, Carl, who's fantastic. Um, so that well was Well done, it. Dr. Tim Dunn. Yeah, well no, done. he was a fantastic yeah. man. Um, I, always, I, I can still hear it. That was now. That was then. This is now. Um, was that in 2013? Yeah. I think I was in uh, St. Francis Farm because I remember Bruce Springsteen's tour was on at the time. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. he did Norland Park as well, didn't he? He did Norland Park and Kenny and, and Belfast. Yeah. yeah. And Belfast yeah. as well, yeah. Brilliant. Um, but he's meant to be unreal live as a kind of a side thing, but he's meant to be brilliant live. I've never seen yeah. him live. Yeah. yeah. yeah but you know what it is, Jack? Yeah. You, yeah, you I, I don't go to concerts. Um, yeah. Well, we do. We go to every concert, but... We don't go in there. We sit in the cars out the back, like, yeah, oh, it's, yeah. It's, it goes off. You're, 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 you go in for the first two minutes, you say, all right, Grant, see you, yeah. and you're going out the door. Um, in the car park of Bruce Springsteen's hands are listening to the Dubliners on the radio. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, often happened. But, um, yeah. yeah, so so that that's the way it went. Um, and so, I kept, anyway, I'd done the courses, came back, um, said, can I get taxi drivers to, to start? So, after being on the radio, um, a couple of people in the radio decided they wanted to do the course as well. So we got 25 people in Kilkenny. The assist. The assist. Uh, no, a safe talk first. Safe, yeah. yeah. Um, and you see, you won't get tax drivers to do two full days because they yeah, do work. Yeah, I know, and I know. Do yeah. all this. You're not going to do it. I do it because I wanted to do it. Yeah. Um, some of them have gone on to do it themselves. Um, but we don't, all we, we were doing at the time was assist. So got the assist course or the safe talk course done uh, 25 was Kilkenny Andrew McGuinness the mayor of Kilkenny at the time um, he gave us his, his um, whatever you call it his, his room yeah. um, 
his quarters, whatever it is, and we done it there, and he done it as well. Um, and then stuff started to happen. Um, documentary was asked to go to make a documentary on us. They followed us around for nearly a year, shooting this documentary of what we do. And um, but very very quickly, people were looking for help. Very like unbelievably quickly, like we went in a couple of days because we we're all over the radio then and it got popular and I was so ashamed at the time that I had depressed been depressed and, and all this I didn't know anyone else had been depressed and now all of a sudden you're telling me you're depressed and mm. had depression for years and you tried to kill yourself and you're telling me and I'm there holy Jesus is this as bad as mm. I know because I, I was completely ignorant of it so everybody is asking for help every single person doctors judges guards solicitors everybody so it's not people that are on the on the, on the floor um, with no money and living mm. in tents it's not just them it's people that are living in mansions and as I said from the very start yeah. it doesn't matter who you are the depression and suicide doesn't care who you are it'll attack you if it wants to and it'll get in on you and mm. unless you ask for help you, 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 and it can happen to anybody um, at any time in your life I never thought I'd have depression in my life Like um, yeah. I was always joking and messing and still yeah. do um, but there's still days now I get bad days mm. um, but I know how to beat it now and I, I always say, don't let the fecker win. Don't let it beat you. Get mm. up and get out. Get out of the house. Go for a walk. Um, but I never walked. And I've been telling people for years, for since this, since 2014, since we started Taxi Watch, um, look at exercise is brilliant. Exercise. And here's me sitting there and eating pizzas. <laughs> and uh, now I didn't think I needed to help. And whether people know it or not, the people that I'm talking to in the cars that are suicidal. A man, uh, there was a chap got into the car. He was at the river one night, and I got him off it and got him into the car. He was um, gay, couldn't tell his father. Um, he was from Galway. He was down at the Kenny on a stag night. And I said, "Well, look," I said, "Do you want me to ring your dad?" And I said, "He wanted to tell him, but he couldn't tell him." And I didn't know what to say to him. And, and he said, to me, do you, "I said, do you want me to tell your dad?" So he said, "Yeah, would you mind?" <laughs> so I said, "Right," because I wasn't expecting him to say yeah. So um, we brought him up to a hotel. Into Kenny, got him a room, got him away from his mates because his mates didn't, they left him. Um, got him away from you. Know, I ran a hotel and said, Look, have you any room I can put this fella into? I said, I'll sit outside the room. I said, As, Make sure the windows are locked. I said, And the whole lot. So, got him a room. Um, I ran his dad from outside and I told him, His dad said, Sure, I know he's gay. And he knew about it. And this young lad had been hiding it for years and years and years. Now, to be honest with you, I knew he was gay the minute he got into the car by looking mm. at him anyway. But he didn't know that his parents knew about it. So his parents said, look, can you hang on to him? And they drove from Galway at two o'clock in the morning, right down to Kilkenny, um, picked him up and, and went away. But things like that is what, is what started to happen. And every day people are getting into the taxis with the drivers and just breaking down. We're the last person at night to see a person going home. Mm-hmm. Um, we're the last person they meet and, and then they're in their house so if they can't talk to you and get it out now mm-hmm. that's it they're, they're in bother when they go inside in the house so they just start talking to us and because we were on the radio so much the newspaper so much every media place in the, in the country took it up um, and he turned he turned that movement in, you turned into a charity it turned into a charity yeah we, what happened was uh, I didn't want to be a charity I had no interest, interest whatsoever in becoming a charity because as far as I was concerned, charities only raise fundraisers, pay the CEOs, all this was in my head. Like, that's they're a waste of time, but they're not, and they, they need to be there. So, uh, seven years went by, um, we weren't a charity, we weren't fundraising, we weren't doing anything. And next minute, we got a phone call saying, either become a charity or stop doing what you're doing. And I said, Well, you can, and I won't tell you what I said to them. And mm-hmm. they said, Well, we can make it so that we, we, you can't keep doing what you're doing. So, I said, Well, what's involved? And Little did I know the hardship that was involved in becoming a charity. It was absolutely, it was horrible. It was the worst experience. It was nearly as bad as experience I've, I've been in. So um, over the last two years, we've been trying to become a charity. So it wasn't happening. I had to keep sending in stuff and keep sending in this and keep sending in this. Um, and there was always more needed and more needed and more needed. Um, and we got no help from the HSE whatsoever. They don't help you. And that's, I'm not trying to put down the HSE now, but yeah. they, they look after their own. And any little organizations and charities around the country are on your own. The HC don't step in. Like it took them nine years to help PA the house, um, which is ridiculous, absolutely mm. ridiculous. But they just don't don't do it. So um, mm. when we were training all the taxi drivers, it was getting harder and harder, and they were starting to put kind of walls up against me. And I said, "This was this only maybe two years into it." And I said, "Well, what, why can't we train tax more taxi drivers?" I said, "I have another twenty five here who want to be trained." They said, "No, no, we can't do individual groups." The HSC said. So I said, "But well, sure, why? Like, what difference does it make who you train? As long as they're training people." I said, "We need it this done." So they wouldn't do it. So I was there. What am I going to do? Is there any other training? I guess so. We could do three tra- three people every three months or four months. I said, "That's no good. That's not going to help me." So I asked, "Could I become a trainer?" to, the, to a, a woman in the HSE um, and she said you and I said yeah I said, but you're a taxi driver 
And I said, okay, and what's that got to do with me becoming so a trainer? Not able, like, I said, well, you wouldn't have the qualifications to be, to be a trainer. And I said, you haven't asked me what qualifications I had or I don't have, yeah. I said, to become a trainer. I said, you just assume I'm a dumb taxi driver and I have no brains. Yeah. So, oh, no, that's not what I'm saying at all. But it was exactly what they were yeah. saying. So they wouldn't do it. And they, the people who own Safe Talk and Assist, um, I've been in contact with them over the years. They contacted me and they said, what you're doing is fantastic. You're an absolute inspiration and blah, blah, blah. And as I said to you, Laurent, I don't take compliments. I don't, I don't like people giving me compliments. Um, I'm just not able for it. So they kept saying, you're a hero, you're this. And then after winning Unsung Hero in, in 2016 award, and um, I was delighted. Like, it was, it was yeah. going to get it. But, so I kept kept doing things and kept trying to push this on and push this on and push this on, and they wouldn't do it. So they contacted me and asked me, um, would I be interested in becoming a trainer? And sure, my eyes lit up. And they were going to uh, send me to Canada. They were going to pay for all the training for me to become a trainer and all that. So I was going in July. Um, and next minute, I got a call saying it's all off. And I said, why? Um, well, I can't really tell you. And I said, HSE. And he goes, yeah. So they put a block on it. They have the rights to safe talk and assist for this country. Um, and anybody outside the, the HSE can't become a trainer. And I said, but I'm not trying to make money. We're doing this for free. We're giving away free training. I'll train for free. I won't charge you anything. They said, no, can't do it. So they wouldn't allow me to do it. So I was absolutely frustrated. Um, and then I met a fantastic man. While we were doing tax setting up Taxi Watch, we went down this, um, met this man, Ray Cullen. He's in a, an organization called Talk to Tom in Gorey. Um, it's, com- it's a charity and they're completely voluntary. Nobody gets paid. And that's what I loved straight away because there's nobody on 300 grand a year or 220 grand a year wages. So uh, I said to Ray, what can we do? And he said, well, we have training called QPR. Um, and QPR is um, basically, the easiest way for me to describe it is assist in one day rather than stretch it over two days and it's it's, it's, it's an excellent course absolute excellent course um, so I said to him well can we use that training for tax drivers and he said absolutely so they've actually changed the course mm. um, and made they, they can deviate the course and they made it for exactly for tax drivers um, as well so now we have a course that it's accredited it's all um, perfectly done and I became a trainer in it um, Ray trained me he's a master trainer for Ireland and he trained me free of charge um, to become a trainer which is fantastic so we're all ready to go so now I had to become the charity uh, so that was the next obstacle I got across. It, was, it was a constant constant battle to, to do this they, they wanted me to go away they didn't want me to, to keep doing what we were doing so eventually um, I, I had to get indemnity insurance so we had to get all of this sort of stuff organised and we were getting all that organised and then it just kept getting kicked down the road, the charity kicked down the road and it wouldn't help us. Um, and I said, what am I going to do? So I went to Ray and Ray said, well, I'll tell you what we do. Uh, well, I, I asked him, would you take the charity? Would you take, if I hand you Taxi Watch as an initiative, I said, I'm the founder of it. I said, will you take it on as an initiative of your organization? Didn't know whether he would, didn't know where he And absolutely in a heartbeat, snapped it up. And he said, yeah, we said, we'd love to roll that out across the country. So they um, put it to the, Charity regulator, and they were. In fairness, in the end, the charity regulator were brilliant. They were they were fantastic. They helped me out in the mm. end, but just took a while. Um, and I can see the problems. There was I was a one man band, yeah. and they were kind of afraid I was doing all the work. If I went sick tomorrow morning, who'd run taxi watch and all these things were coming. So they were right in the water, mm. even though it was taking time. They were right. Um, but now uh, talk to Tom. I've taken over the initiative. They're going to roll it out, and within I'd say a few days of becoming a charity the National Transport Authority rang us um, and said they want to help roll it out across the whole of Ireland to every single tax driver in Ireland which is just phenomenal, absolutely yeah. fantastic um, the UK have been on they want to roll it out across the whole of the UK as well so we couldn't have done that with the HSE's course because we could do three drivers a month or every three months which mm. was ridiculous now we can do 25 drivers or 50 drivers every day if we want to, um, and yeah. we plenty of drivers. So that's what it is. Um, and as I said to you before, the reason the reason Taxi Watch worked um, was because of, I, I was telling you earlier on, a taxi driver got a call um, to pick up somebody and he went and picked them up. The person asked to go to a location um, miles away, absolutely more, 120 euros away. And taxi driver, sure, he was delighted. He, uh, he just saw money and, and he said, a nice fare brought your man to where he wanted to go. The man paid it, the, the driver his money. He never spoke the whole way up. Uh, paid the man the money and uh, said, look, I don't need these. And he gave him his keys, his wallet and his phone. And he said, I won't need these anymore. And he slammed the door. So the driver was sitting in the car and didn't know what was going on. Didn't cop it. Now, 
any of us would have copped yeah. what was going on because the location why would you be going there at half 11 at night pitch dark so we got out to see where the man was and he was gone um, and unfortunately that person was found the next morning um, taking their life and um, that's why Taxi Watch works because and that's why it has worked in Kilkenny um, I'm different everybody knows me so people have no bother opening up to me as well but now all our other drivers are people are opening up to them um, they're walking up with stickers on our cars in Taxi Watch and they're a little small sticker and people know the cars and they're actually getting into the cars and because they know they can talk to this driver and there's no judgment and, mm -hmm. and it's absolutely fantastic and um, is there taxi watch drivers in Cork? there will be um, I, after this actually we've, I've a meeting um, in Cork we Cork 96 FM are going to help us bring it out um, and yeah I'm really looking forward to it That's but it's, it's, going to, it's definitely going to Cork um, my uncle Pat is a Pat Leonard he's a taxi driver in Dublin I wonder is he a taxi watcher I must text him yeah, afterwards yeah, and yeah. ask him I have a question for you do you have to be a taxi driver to put a, a taxi watch sticker on your, your no, vehicle. No, if anybody well, wants one, they can do it because our, so our contact are, details are on it. Yeah, 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 there are genuine people out there who really do care about people mm. and they'd love to be able to help out in that way. Yeah. So if, if there's anyone listening... Oh, any taxi driver there, they can contact me through the Facebook page yeah. or, or contact me directly via my own Facebook page yeah. or whatever. Yeah. Um, and I'll take one for myself as well. Yeah, no problem. I'm sure James will. Yeah. yeah, but it's great because it's, it's like, as I said, when you do the training... Tell you, you go in as a taxi driver and you leave as a taxi driver, like yourselves. You're mm. not trained counselors, you're not trained this. All we're trying to do is help people. And at the start, we've, we've got no negativity. We, we, no, I'm lying to you. We have, we have one person who has given us negativity for maybe the first year and broke my heart, absolutely broke my heart. Um, and I blocked, blocked him from Facebook and he came on his, in his wife's page and kept doing it and all that, saying that we're not psychologists. We shouldn't be counseling people in the car. We're not counseling people. We signpost people to where they can get the help. Yeah. That's all. We it's are. actually That's very similar to what we do, Timmy. Exactly. Yeah. yeah exactly. Yeah. And a lot of people contact us too, and we just signpost people. Really. That's all it is. Yeah. That's all it is. And as I said, it's lived experience. Mm. You can't help anybody unless you've you've gone through a lived experience. And, and what I mean by that is, a person who goes to college for four years, you can go to college for ten years if you like, and to learn about depression. But if you haven't had it, don't ever dare tell anybody who has depression. You know mm. how they're feeling. Mm. You don't know how they're feeling. You don't know what's going on in their head. Um, you don't know what's going on in their life. You, you, you've no no idea. Like um, even back, I remember my, my son's a Man United fan. Um, Fair play, as well. Uh, yeah, and I hate soccer. I hate sports, as I said to you already. Um, I go to Liverpool matches. I go to Celtic matches with the lads. I go to United matches with my son. But I remember the last United match was um, I think it was twenty thirteen, and it was Alex Ferguson's last match. And I was at that match. Now these tickets were like gold dust, and here's me sitting in the crowd, no interest in being there whatsoever. <laughs> but I was there for my son. Um, and he turned around to me and he said, Daddy, today is the best day of my life. And I was in the height of depression at that time. Um, and he said, today is the best day of my life. And he looked down at me and Alex Ferguson was going around and he was waving. And we all had flags and all the crowd was crying because Alex was leaving. And I just burst into tears. And the woman beside me uh, leans over and she's like, no, shit, it's terrible. I said, yeah, yeah, poor Alex. I said, no, if Alex had got a heart attack and died on the pitch that day, I wouldn't have cared. Um, <laughs> just what was going on in your she, own head. Yeah, my own head was yeah. crying because of that. And sure, Keen thought then I was crying because of uh, Alex Ferguson and all that. Um, What's the plan for the future, very briefly? Uh, plan for, my plan for the future is to... Uh, get every part of Ireland tax drivers covered um, mm. as many as we can not every tax driver wants to do it obviously um, some people just feel they can't do that and, and that's their choice um, some people said to me it should be mandatory it shouldn't um, it, some people aren't up to it and that's their own yeah. way they, they deal with things um, so I'm going to hopefully go to college next year um, to do a degree in training and development um, that's the plan, yeah. Um, Best of luck with it. Yeah, I'm looking forward. I, I, I would never have thought yeah. I've ever go back to college. I, I didn't even do my leaving cert, like um, no interest whatsoever. But um, if there's leaving. anything I can do on a personal level, and I'm sure James has said to get yeah. this going down here and yeah. help you out any way we can. Yeah. Because I think this is very, very important what you're doing. I think it's it's, it's, it's great. Yeah. yeah, it's great. And I just want to can I just say to. Um, I'm not giving Volkswagen a plug mm. here now because they, they've asked me not to plug them at all but uh, Volkswagen mm. gave us a car at the very start of this as a car and I was telling Tim earlier on yeah. that uh, I only had a car an hour and I drove out of, of, of Volkswagen in Dublin um, and they, they labelled it with Taxi Watch it puts uh, stickers all over Taxi Watch helpline numbers the whole lot yeah. and I walked out of the uh, uh, drove out of the, of the office and couldn't believe that Volkswagen were after doing this and is this the first time somebody recognised this is actually worth doing and it's good um, but they told me not to not to bother 
mentioning taxi or Volkswagen or not to do it. We don't want that from you, yeah. um, which was amazing because I thought, wow. okay, you sign up to something like this, next minute you're doing everything. Yeah. Um, but they weren't. They, they were just interested in helping people. And I parked over in Liffey Valley that day and I only had a car an hour and I went into Liffey Valley for food and I came out and there was a man sitting at the wheel of the car and I looked at him I didn't know what he was. I thought he was trying to rob the car first. I didn't know what yeah. was going on. Um, and all I wanted to do was take my phone out and say, look, I told you it works. Um, and I did work, but I, I obviously didn't. But the man needed help and yeah. he saw the car. Yeah. And an hour after after leaving, um, it's I, brilliant. I, I couldn't believe it. Yeah, I couldn't believe yeah. it. So um, thanks play, to Volkswagen for Volkswagen. everything mm-hmm. they do for me because they're and brilliant. I just tried out there as well. The Volkswagen one, I don't know. It's a Golf GTA. We'd have to accept yeah, that. Yeah, that an electric car, an electric car. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, look, you're a great storyteller. Thanks for uh, coming on the podcast. Best of luck with your business in Cork over the weekend with 96 FM. Uh, lovely people over there. Yeah. Um, and have enjoyed the rest of your weekend in you too. the beautiful city of ours. Thanks, Timmy. Thanks, Rowan. Thanks, and thanks, everybody. And thanks, we'll see everyone. you next week.